Hi, um, I'm Helka. I'm a pediatric hematology oncologist at Georgetown. And um, I have to apologize. I got lost on Maryland. I don't know my ways in Maryland, so that's why I'm late. I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, so I'll try to be um, um, fast spoken because I mean I know that it's a little bit late on the day, so let's start. Um, by the way, my presentation doesn't cover the whole detail of pediatric leukemia because that would be impossible. So I'm just going to be for points that are relevant for these days. So the objectives are there, describe uh, the epidemiology and the causes of uh, pediatric acute leukemias, understand the, uh, the management of pediatric acute leukemias and uh, their complications, and know the major challenges that uh, we have now to control the pediatric uh, leukemias. So this is a brief outline. I'll have an introduction talking about the epidemiology, which is relevant uh, now, uh, pathobiology, treatment, and uh, complications, and probably a little bit about future directions in the treatment of uh, pediatric acute leukemias in general. Um, as everybody knows, uh, cancer in children and uh, young adults, adolescents, is a rare disease. However, we know that um, Acute leukemia is the uh, leading cause of of death, uh, of leukemia of uh, cancer in pediatric uh, age, and is one of the leading causes of uh, death in uh, people before, uh, uh, younger than 20 uh, years of age. Um, one of the things that we are proud in pediatric oncology is the fact that uh, we have improved the survival rate of our pediatric cancer to almost 90% um, of uh, the patients will uh, be a survivor nowadays. And this is an achievement that uh, is well known in modern medicine and we are an example for um, adult oncologists, I will say. Um, as I say, the rate of cure has uh, gone so up to the 90% on the acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. And it's not that high in pediatric uh, myeloleukemias, but still we are close to 70% of uh, achieving cure rates. Um, all these uh, achievements and success on the treatment is based on the uh, way that our protocols has been um, designed and we've been dealing since the 1970s, trying to find the most effective dose and to trying the schedule of the chemotherapy agents in the best way to be uh, successful on the cure of this disease. Um, one of the things that the therapy that has been used until the uh, early 2000 were um, chemotherapy that was available for, for many, many, many years, but uh, to find the best way to use it uh, took uh, a little bit longer. So um, every year in the USA, there are around uh, 4,000. It depends what the decade we look, 4,000 to 6,000 uh, children that uh, will be diagnosed with um, uh, leukemia. And we are saying that one in 300 children or younger people less than 20 years of age will be diagnosed uh, with uh, leukemia. Or we can say one children a day will be diagnosed with leukemia in the United States. Uh, the most common... Uh, once talking about acute leukemia, is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which are around 80% of uh, the newly diagnosed um, leukemias, and 20% uh, more or less is acute myeloleukemia, which my dear patient Kalani has talked about extensively. Um, but um, the causation, as we know, has is multifactorial. We have uh, endo exogenous and endogenous exposures. We have uh, some genetic susceptibility, and there are always uh, the, r uh, the role of chance. Sometimes we really don't know why uh, the, the leukemia develop in, in, in younger populations. Uh, there is a um, very nice um, uh, composite that is in the next slide, which try to explain what is the uh, causation of the uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemias or myeloleukemias, mainly acute lymphoblastic leukemias in pediatric age. As I said before, there is always the, the, the chance, I don't know, uh, yeah. chance is something that happens, but it has to be uh, many things that they have to come together to have developed uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in any patient. Um, 
continuing with uh, uh, epidemiology. As I mentioned before, uh, causation is multifactorial. We can talk about radiation. There are many theories. We can talk about any other um, factors. But one of the things that we deal uh, almost um, persistently in our patients is that um, we know that they are a specific uh, genetic um, conditions that put our patients at risk for developing uh, um, leukemia. And those are the patients that are difficult to treat. Uh, they have more complications, and we have to be more, more careful about uh, the type of treatment that we will do. And uh, there is the list of patients, Down syndrome, neuroformatosis, Bloom syndrome. Each one of them come with um, specific uh, genetic abnormalities, and multiple genes are involved that uh, are going to uh, have an effect on the uh, develop of the leukemia itself and also on the treatment, the response to the treatment. Um, this is the greatest graph that we can see and we, we, we feel proud about it and every time that we see it, it says, makes us feel great, I think, every day, uh, seeing how well um, we have increased the survival of our patients, we see that on the, before this, uh, the uh, 1970, uh, less than 10% of our patients were able to survive, but through uh, the last uh, four decades, we can see that we have been achieving this impressive, uh, incre incredible, I will say, uh, results of 90% of our patients now are going to be cured by the current treatment uh, therapies. And um, we can say that this is, this is amazing. But uh, the achievement also comes with some uh, side effects, and we know that um, in the two, 200s, we are seeing uh, um, results of what we have done in the prior years. We'll, I'll talk about that, that later. Um, uh, the pathogenesis of the um, uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia is something that in the last, I will say, 20 years has been uh, study and we have more and more information about what is uh, the events that need to happen in order for our, one of our patients to develop um, uh, leukemia. Um, sorry. Um, so this is the endpoint that we are uh, involved on the uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We have the lymphoid progenitor that is going to either end up being a mature and normal uh, uh, B cell or in, ended up being acute lymphoblastic leukemia, multiple steps. Uh, there is the initiation, there is other factors there, are cooperating events that will trigger the uh, diagnosis of, of uh, the development of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And among um, us that we treat the leukemia, we are happy to have the 90% um, uh, cure, but there is this 10% um, population, it varies on the statistics, but we have uh, patients that unfortunately are going to go and relapse or they won't respond to the therapy. Those are the patients that are, are challenging for us. So we are happy with the results of earlier studies, but now we encounter these patients that are relapsing and they are more difficult to treat, and uh, we have to find a better uh, treatment options that um, I think we are in the best times uh, because we are finding new uh, therapies. Uh, in the past, when we were talking, when we talk about uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it was very easy. We usually uh, related on the risk factors, age, basic things, white blood cell counts, and the morphology, either were uh, acute lymphoblastic or myeloleukemia. But with the advance of the technology, we can have uh, more understanding and a, a better picture of what is this uh, uh, if this disease entitles. And uh, one of the things that is very important is the uh, cytogenetics uh, abnormalities that acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia show. So we have these nice uh, pies, and uh, we can have well uh, well this. Um, well-organized description of each one of the types of leukemias. In the past, we used to say uh, B cell, T cell, and that's all. Or, but now we have more uh, descriptions of the genetic and what are uh, the risk that these leukemic patients will have based on the genetic uh, background. The same thing with acute myeloid leukemia. Now we have the luxury to 
knowing exactly where are the uh, variants and the genetic abnormalities that is going to uh, give us more information how these patients are going to behave and what is the best o option for the treatment because nowadays we just don't uh, random randomly decided on the chemotherapy, but we have the options to work with more target and more individualized chemotherapy. That's uh, what we are doing uh, lately. So um, when we talk about the risk, the risk uh, in uh, leukemia, as, as in, I mentioned before, it was um, simple before. Um, we used to uh, have the age, patients less than one, uh, less than, uh, one year or above 10 years uh, were high risk, and the white blood cell counts above 50,000 was considered high risk. Um, uh, small things that help us in the past to assign a risk for the patients. And when we talk about risk, we always talk about risk of relapsing. So now we have more information that uh, uh, help us to um, have a better uh, treatment plan for our patients. The immu immunophenotype is, is one of the things. And more importantly, we have the cytogenetics and um, the genomic alterations that give us some more information about how really these patients are going to respond to our interventions. Um, the other risk factors, we know that patients with uh, extramedular disease, with CNS mainly, or uh, in boys that uh, testicular disease, those are patients that are going to be a higher risk and they have to get a different treatment. Uh, Down syndrome is a, is a totally different um, um, talk that I'm not going to go in details today. Um, so then uh, the risk assignment with clinical and biological factors and the um, one that in the past it was uh, started with the BMF uh, and the group in, um, in Germany uh, based on the steroid response to the pre-treatment for eight days of steroids, but nowadays we have a more and uh, qualified information with the minimal residual disease that is done by flow cytometry or by PCR. So that is um, the standard of, uh, of response and that is going to trigger the stratification of um, intensification of the therapy. So that is very important. Um, just a few words about the treatment. Um, they uh, have a, a in the acute lymphoblastic leukemia, multi um, therapy agent with uh, the induction uh, phase, where is six more or less six months of a very very intensive chemotherapy. Then we go to the consolidation and then the maintenance therapy. So in total, the the length of the treatment is going to be between two. Two five, uh, two point five to three years, because in boys we extend the treatment uh, longer for the um, risk of relapsing in the sanctuary that we call uh, the testis, and um, in the girls is less, uh, is two point five years. Um, and uh, I say before there is a group of patients either they relapse or they don't respond to the therapy that are uh, uh, going to be treated with bone marrow transplant. Acute myeloleukemia um, also has uh, intensive uh, cycles of, of uh, chemotherapy, but um, those are uh, in, in induction and consolidation only, and usually um, no more than five or six cycles will, is, is enough to achieve some uh, response. And um, we know that more of the patients in the acute myeloleukemia group uh, will require the bone marrow transplant uh, due to the uh, uh, genetic abnormalities that we know that they put them at uh, higher risk to not responding to the therapy. Uh, as, as I say before, uh, we are in uh, times where we have a good success in some of the uh, most of our patients, but still there are a challenge that we have to address and uh, we are encounter in our practice uh, because I do mainly clinical um, uh, work um, regarding the challenge, the, the therapeutic questions remains uh, uh, to be answered. There are biological and therapeutic questions that are remain to be answered. Um, Patients that uh, in the past were overtreated, nowadays we are seeing the, the, the side effects of, of those overtreatment. And um, patients who, had, who has um, highly resistant disease, sometimes they don't have access to the most um, outstanding drugs or therapies that can, uh, I, um, can bring them to, uh, to remission. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we have to feel uh, proud again is because in ASCO 2018, after a long study and, and very 
very good uh, response uh, from the Breast Cancer Society. Um, they conclude something that we have been doing it for the last 30 years, that uh, we have a stratification in our patients. We don't give chemotherapy, the same type of chemotherapy for patients that we consider low risk, and the patients that are high risk, they will receive more chemotherapy. So uh, not too much, not too little is something that in pediatric oncology we have been do, uh, we've been doing it for the last 30 years, so that's why we have a good success on the therapy. Um, I mentioned that um, some of the things that we have done in the past regarding the, the, the therapy is uh, concerning now and uh, that uh, we have access to information and we can start uh, working on what uh, to avoid during, uh, we've been working on avoiding uh, certain therapies. So um, the late effects on, on the children that they were treated for cancer is something that um, was well studied and we know that um, they are at risk of developing more um, type of uh, uh, complications comparing to the uh, to uh, their siblings and one of the things that is relevant is the cardiac um, this is going too fast for me I'm going too slow so um, the cardiac is uh, something that they have showed that the hazard ratio is 11 and the other uh, problems that they have is um, risk of a stroke and heart attack so um, renal failure also, so this is a very nice graph about whether really our uh, patients uh, are encountered um, nowadays. So we don't know what is going to happen later, but that's something that is always in the back of our minds, the, the difference of, of cardiac disease and uh, the risk of secondary malignancy is also something that uh, we always consider when we treat our patients, and we are seeing that they are a higher risk to develop, developing that um, so again, what is going to uh, all that uh, bring us to what is uh, the goal that uh, and the the talk about uh, having a personalized medicine because not uh, every every child is, is every child is unique. We know that each one of our patients is unique. We we remember each one of them, and that's something that uh, we are going to try to do in more personalized ways. Uh, another thing is that. Um, Understanding better the genetic lesions and uh, try to understand the mechanisms of what uh, some of our chemotherapy or some drugs don't don't work well in, in certain uh, patients is something that um, uh, is advancing now. Um, all that information is going to help us to to again do a, a better uh, risk adapted uh, treatment in the years coming back. Um, just to mention about, um, again, the risk adapted treatment in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and in acute myeloleukemia, patients with Philadelphia positive chromosome in the past, uh, I mean, it was uh, almost um, all of them, they, 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 they used to have bone marrow transplant, but nowadays we can consider that some of these patients are going to be patients that are, uh, I mean, they are cured with the uh, with a, a, a very uh, a good medication, and um, they are not getting transplanted at the first remission now. Uh, the other group that uh, we know exists is the high-risk T cell, the pro T cell uh, leukemia, which has showed that it's not responsive to to uh, the regular standard or high-risk therapy for uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. They has more response to my low type of, of treatment, so that's something that we have been able to um, just uh, recent, um, recently recognize. Infant acute lymphoblastic leukemia is something that, um, I mean, it's, it's a, tough, uh, um, uh, a tough diagnosis to treat, but um, let me tell you, I have a patient that uh, he had uh, infant leukemia. He was diagnosed at three months of age. He had two relapses. Uh, he went for bone marrow transplant, and uh, he relapsed uh, after the bone marrow transplant. And finally, he got the CAR T cell therapy, and now he is 18 months of uh, the initial infusion of the CAR T cell, and he's doing wonderful. So uh, that's one of the things that uh, give us hope to continue doing what we are doing. Adolescent acute lymphoblastic leukemia is so another group that has uh, showed that um, 
had, has better outcomes when it's treated with pediatric uh, uh, protocols because we know that we have uh, more intensive chemotherapy uh, through the protocols, but the uh, um, success is, is higher than uh, they are treating on the uh, adult oncology uh, groups. And there is other, uh, other high-risk group that uh, I won't go in details. And um, the acute myeloleukemic uh, patients, they have a very good outcomes when they have uh, translocation 8 or intervention 16. Um, so that's important to take into account before starting the treatment. So when we have those good uh, um, characteristic uh, presentations, we don't give the, uh, I will say, the more intensive chemotherapy, but they still we have patients with the FLE3 uh, mutation that they still are a challenge, even though we have uh, fludarabine. That, oh, it's not fludarabine, another medication that uh, helps specifically with that one. Um, so I'm just going to talk about one of the examples about uh, doing a target therapy. Um, we know, uh, and everybody have heard about the TKI, which is um, was used initially in chronic myeloleukemia, but now, because uh, our patients with lymphoblastic leukemia can uh, benefit of it. So um, this is the translocation and I-22 that everybody knows, uh, the Philadelphia chromosome that um, is present in, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia too. So the uh, glibecoimatanib is a TKI uh, inhibitor that uh, binds to the BCR uh, AVL. So keeping inactive and uh, stopping the progression and multiplication of the cells. So that's something that uh, we know that works and many of our patients are now on the protocols of um, uh, COG being treated with this one, and even with the second uh, generation of uh, TKI has a good uh, response and the outcomes have been great. Um, just to show how great is the success uh, when we try to adjust and do a stratification and do a target therapy, this is the graph. Um, it's a little bit old, but uh, before the, the imatanib, our uh, patients uh, with the chromosome of Philadelphia, they have a very uh, low uh, event-free survival. Many of them relapse. But nowadays, we are seeing that 80% uh, of uh, survival is on the patients that are being treated with ALL. And this has been uh, persistently um, um, present, even uh, trying a second generation of uh, TKI. So that is target therapy, and that's what we are uh, trying to do in uh, almost all of uh, the patients that we have. Um, another uh, example of um, more um, target therapy is in um, uh, acute myeloleukemia, the promyelocytic leukemia that uh, in the past, before the 70s, uh, the survival and the achieve uh, remission was less than 50%, uh, but nowadays uh, we are close to 90%. As you know, Acute promyelocytic leukemia is a very, uh, very uh, nasty, uh, nasty uh, diagnosis to treat initially because of the high risk of bleeding, and many of the patients could uh, could have uh, serious uh, complications. And um, the characteristic uh, promyelocytic uh, blast, as you see on on, on panel B, uh, and this is a fish and. The recognition and, and and description of the translocation for uh, the ATRA um, for the RR PML uh, translocation is something that uh, has been a target for uh, for the therapy and uh, this is a timeline about uh, what happened with this um, diagnosis. So uh, before 57 uh, and 57 that this, uh, that was the first description and. Um, in 1973, the um, um, chemotherapy was first uh, started and uh, achieved a remission on 50% of the patients, but they relapsed and the remission was not sustained. And uh, on the 87s, the first response to ATRA was um, reported and uh, after the specific uh, translocation was uh, described. So nowadays we have a better uh, sense of how we treat the um, promyelocytic leukemia. Our patients live longer and they don't have the complications. 
and uh, the combination of other of chem and chemotherapy has been a, stand a standard for the last 10 years, but um, there is uh, a new study that um, has shown a benefit of not using any chemotherapy, only using um, arsenic uh, and ATRA. And the uh, response rate is being uh, all, is, is, is similar of patients with uh, ATRA and chemotherapy, and the side effects are, are minimal. So there is um, some results that are encouraging and um, so that's uh, something that we are looking forward to have more similar uh, experience with other type of, uh, of, cancer, of leukemias. So this is the, this nice uh, uh, events-free survival. As I said before, uh, uh, on the 70s, the patients were uh, almost here below 25 survival. And then we have now a days after the 90, uh, 1972, almost 100% of events free survival in the patients with uh, uh, that combination of therapy. Um, my apologies, this is a very, very busy slide, but just to give a sense uh, where we are now with the list of medications and therapeutic options that we can uh, uh, have a hand of for our patients. And the last one that uh, we hear is that gentuzumab was um, approved uh, last year for acute myeloleukemia, which is encouraging. So there are many things that uh, we are still waiting for the approval, but um, hopefully uh, we are going to get a good number of other options for our patients. Um, oh, another one, uh, looking on the different ways to treat besides um, chemotherapies, immunotherapy, and I think uh, the CAR T cell has been uh, um, a great news for everybody, uh, starting pediatrics, of course, pediatric oncology, and now it's being approved for treatment in adult um, um, uh, patients with cancer too. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go in much detail uh, because we know almost everything about that. Um, it's, 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 it's well described. Um, to the point that now we are talking about second generation of CAR T cells for, uh, for the treatment of patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and the other uh, um, immunotherapy that is being uh, available and is, is, in, uh, is giving us a good, uh, good sense of, uh, of uh, uh, um, success is the VITA therapy that um, is being around and uh, is being a start uh, treat is, uh, is being a uh, trial in some of uh, patients. Um, I think we are going to have a discussion uh, lecture about that. Correct? Yeah. In a, oh, okay. Oh, that is the new one. W is not coming after me. <laughs> okay. So the biospecific uh, antibodies. This is a nice graph about uh, what are the white cells and uh, that uh, is available in some uh, centers. I'll try to give a small explanation about uh, those cells. So um, uh, antibody that is constructed to target both CD3 and um, uh, CD19, uh, which is expressed only in B cells. So you can have see here, we have the monoclonal uh, part that uh, is compound with uh, a single chain of antibodies here, and that this is, a, is able to uh, have T cell ligand with the target cell through the um, single chain uh, target monoclonal antibody. Um, so to conclude, uh, so there are things that we have to do to, um, to uh, determine the optimal dosing and uh, some of the chemotherapy. Of course, we have to um, try to have our individualized treatment for all of the patient, which sometimes is, uh, is not the, the common uh, situation in many centers. Um, thanks to the uh, advances of um, biomedical technology, we have more access to more information, but sometimes we don't know what, the, what, what that information means, and it's so much that sometimes we get lost and uh, we don't know how to interpret or what to do with it. And um, of course, the development of new therapies has, uh, has helped out, uh, to the advance and uh, uh, to achieve more um, success on uh, no children should have died of cancer. Um, 
However, I think uh, one of the challenge for us as a pediatric oncologist and living in a country where we have all these resources is that uh, we shouldn't forget that there are other places in where being Christine of Pegasparginus is not available all the time. So um, I think one of the goals and uh, when we, we, we are together is work to uh, ways that we can extend these therapies, these benefits um, probably around the world and probably that's the best thing that we can do. Thank you and muchas gracias.